One of the readings with which we begin the semester is Towards an Aboriginal Art History by Gerald McMaster. Gerald McMaster is a Plains Cree. He is an alumni of the Institute of American Indian Arts and is one of the foremost curators and you might say uh, philosophers of uh, art in general as well as in particular First Nations art in Canada um, in the 21st century. And throughout the course you're going to encounter uh, Gerald McMaster in various articles as well as in exhibitions uh, because he really has a wonderful uh, view from the inside looking out. And that's what's so critical about this particular uh, article. The article itself is a bit uh, dense in that the language that McMaster uses is the language of the profession. And uh, this is why it's a good idea um, in this class, because it is a 300 level class, that you have a dictionary handy because there are going to be key terms that you are expected to be able to define and apply as part of your study. So some of the key terms that you encounter in the reading are ahistorical, ethnocentric, grand recit, mainstream, meta discourse, postmodern, teleology, and universality. I expect you to be able to define as well as explain and even apply these terminologies either in quizzes or in exams. So if you don't have a dictionary, there's a great online Webster's Dictionary. I strongly suggest you use it. Now the article itself deals with McMaster's commentary on what is seen as uh, in the in the late 19th or, I'm sorry the late 20th century artistic trends uh, that were being in many ways um, confronted as well as established and even uh, challenged by First Nations. Now when we say First Nations we're talking about Canadian uh, artists. However we could take the same type of commentary that McMaster is using um, in this particular article towards in our Aboriginal heart history and apply that same commentary to what we see going on in the United States and to some degree um, even um, uh, 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 as we, we, could, we could look at Mexico. Why it's important to see this connection between the United States and Canada though is we have to understand that Canada was part of the uh, British Empire as was the United States. So they share a common history and therefore in many ways share a common set of ideologies while they may have different governments um, that they are both based uh, in Great Britain philosophy, Great, Great Britain law, and then even as they are independent on their on their own, um, still to some degree remain vestiges of their Euro uh, pagan history. So this is why it's important to really make this connection between First Nations and what we would call Native Americans in the United States. And what McMaster, uh, when he's talking about Carl Beam and a presentation that Carl Beam does in which he talks about mainstream uh, uh, art and the participation of First Nations people in it. And he talks about it as being a very shallow stream and for that matter maybe only ankle deep. And it's a, um, it is to some degree very tongue in cheek. And, why, and the importance of this is that it's a commentary on to what degree our native peoples, whether they are in the United States, Canada, or any other part in this hemisphere, um, to what degree are they engaged in a story that is already in place and one that is more, uh, you might say, working to absorb First Nations and American Indians rather than to recognize that there are separate and distinct histories rather than a monolithic European art history. And so that's what this particular um, discussion is going to be about, which is challenging a Eurocentric notion. As you read the McMaster article then, you should be asking yourself what is mainstream in Native American art or First Nation art? What do you think would be the defining qualities or characteristics? And who are the primary artists who you think exemplify what we might consider to be mainstream if such a thing exists? And we might also ask how are Native artists then engaging in
against and outside the discussion of art history. And that is the uh, central focal point of the McMaster uh, article. And it is a central part of the critique of the way that native creative uh, impulses have been discussed, uh, particularly in an era that we now call post-colonial, and for that matter, post-modern. And it is how the people who have been colonized and are now in the uh, modern era are looking back. How have they survived uh, through a time period when dominant powers thought that they would vanish? And what are their observations, not only of what occurred, but their observations of where they stand, not only as artists, but as native peoples and as global peoples? And for that matter, where are they headed uh, for the future? And in doing so, and in, in challenging uh, the dominant perceptions by asking these types of key questions, the real challenge in many ways is against a concept that we're going to introduce now that is known as Eurocentrism as well as ethnocentrism. Now ethnocentrism is the belief that your ethnic group is the normal group that it is the group by which you measure um, all other groups around you. In other words, you are normal. Everyone else is the other. Um, that you are, you consider your ways, your beliefs, your history to be superior to that of the other. And you also assume that the other aspires to be like you. Because if you are at the center of the world, why would not anyone want to be at the center with you? Hand in hand with ethnocentrism, then, is a term that uh, is part of what we would call the postmodern critique of art, and for that matter of history, which is Eurocentrism, which is the view that Europe European history is the center of history, Europe is the center, and we even see this in art history itself. Um, but so a Eurocentric view is one that suggests that Europe is at the center of history, in particular art history, and we could even uh, uh, point to Italy for that matter when we're talking about Florentine uh, Italy and the Renaissance as being the beginning of recording art history uh, with the intent to uh, make sense of history beyond art that was not sanctioned by the church. And when we have a Eurocentric view um, we in essence uh, believe that people who are not of European lineage are um, you might say outside of the dominant trends in art and for that matter very often are inferior and it is the view that all of the great gifts in many ways um, came from Europeans rather than uh, as part of a collaboration whether it be willing or not of various world cultures who at various times in history um, were in contact with each other and even in conflict with each other that they exchanged a wide range of ideas and then um, emerged um, with new ways of using old ideas and old technologies. In a very real way, had it not been for Islam, um, Europe probably would have been, for example, floundering in the Dark Ages for another 300 years because it was the Moors who, for example, translated the Greek classics and Greek philosophy um, for the Spaniards in Spain. As, and when we look at Spanish architecture, we see the influence of the Middle East. Um, and the, uh, the Moors being astute scientists, by the way, they were, you know, they were Muslim. Um, uh, astute astronomers, um, astute shipbuilders, astute navigators. Um, they, they had amazing advances in medicine, metallurgy. And these were technologies that were transferred to Europe. So we see that a, that a conquering power can bring wonderful technologies that will promote uh, cultural change and cultural development. However, when we feel that we are the only ones who possess these innovations and they are in many ways that it was destiny that we would be the ones who possess them then we start to give way to this notion of centrism this has been challenged then in the post-colonial in other words the people who have been colonized and who are now looking back um, after the colonial period and are critiquing what occurred to them but also by feminist uh, historians and then the postmodern critiques and these then have opened fissures. They, in essence, have, have made cracks um, in this uh, seeming uh, unbreakable story of the history of the world, and for that matter, the history of the art world. McMaster, in essence, is constructing not only by giving you a 
literature review of how various other authors and thinkers and philosophers have been analyzing and have been creating fissures in the Eurocentric view of history. So he's, he is, in essence, giving you a survey of what other people have thought or have written about it, as well as uh, has provided you with his own ideas. And then through the description and through the analysis of several First Nations uh, artists have shown how they em uh, exemplify um, some of the challenge to um, Eurocentrism and the challenge to what we might call a grand narrative or a grand recital or a grand récit. So Jean-Francois Lyotard, uh, when he was talking about a grand narrative, um, as is mentioned by uh, McMaster, that we look at these grand narratives are the, leg the legitimizing myths of modern culture. In other words, they are the myths, and, and w when we're talking about myths, we're not necessarily talking about something that is false. We're talking about a story that explains something, that gives a reason for something. So what a grand narrative is, it's the stories that cultures create in order to lay claim to their view of history, their view of how things came to be, um, their view of why the world is the way it is and why they are in charge of it, in essence. All right, so this is what we would see as these grand narratives. All right, they are these stories that seem to neatly tie all of these thousands of years of human events into a neat bundle and through the way they are tied together explain why um, various cultures dominate in history um, at particular times. And we'd find out that what we would call a grand narrative in the year uh, 1500 would be very different than the grand narratives that we would see told today. Because in 1500 and, and beyond, uh, even into 1600, Spain um, would have had these grand narratives as to why they were one of the most powerful nations on earth. We now see this as part of United States history. Um, and, and they are taught to school children every day. But they are these stories that explain how things came to be. And as part of it, then, is if we understand that history is very selective, there really is no such thing as true history. There are facts that we can talk about, but the way that they are um, described, the way they are brought to us, um, it's going to be all a matter of perception and a matter of focus because we can never get a 100 complete 100 percent complete record of anything that occurs and so in many ways um, history is very incomplete and so at best when we're looking at the construction of history which we're going to ana analyze a little bit more uh, later on in the semester is how is some um, history constructed and in essence what we look at are plausible explanations and so when we're looking at legit legitimizing myths all right in many ways they are plausible um, explanations of how cultures came to dominate and why certain uh, even even artistic trends um, are defined but this has also been by Kaja Silverman called a dominant fiction all right, and that is this is part of what um, the postmodern, uh, post-colonial feminist and and the like. Um, these are part of the fissures that are starting to be created. All right, and they are they are puncturing holes in what we would call dominant fictions. In other words, that uh, when we're looking at this fiction, it's how a society that is in power organizes, constructs, and even constitutes the world um, through basic elements as the foundations for the story. And other words um, how um, did the values of this uh, of this culture um, cause them to dominate um, how is it that they are able to selectively remember certain events and selectively selectively forget others in order to construct views of history so when we're looking at dominant fictions um, it, we're not necessarily even saying that something is false because you can be telling true things and yet still be uh, presenting falsehoods by what you choose to leave out. All right, has someone ever said to you, um, how does this look at me? Or how does this, um, how does this shirt look on me? And you don't want to hurt their feelings. And so you say, oh, wow, great greens are really great color. And 
the shirt may not really look good on them, but you've commented about the color so you could say something positive. In essence, you have, through omission, not told the truth of what you think, and the person asked you for your opinion. Well, they do this in the way that history is constructed, too. And so, and this in a very real way um, is a way that uh, various societies maintain a sense of identity. The United States, for example, and Canada, for example, have never really been able to tell their history in a true way, in a mass-mediated uh, manner, because to do so would be to have to acknowledge the grave injustices that it, and for that matter, Great Britain, the grave injustices that it exacted on peoples the worldwide, and the mayhem um, that they have exacted on tribal peoples and other cultures worldwide. But in order to maintain this land of the free, home of the brave, or old Canada, um, sense of a national identity, it is important to have a dominant fiction. And that dominant fiction um, is pervasive in all ways of viewing history and culture. So that includes not only culture history, but it includes art history, it, co it includes uh, political history, it includes economic history. Um, it is all uh, encompassing um, the dominant fictions that are created um, through the incomplete um, telling of the facts. And when Victor Bergen is talking about how art histories construct art history by projecting dominant contemporary notions of art into the past and the future, um, that it means that, that what Bergen's, Bergen's talking about is how art histor historians uh, are, um, have looked into the past and are using an aesthetic of the present to discuss past events, past peoples, and for that matter to discuss the future, um, which is um, a very a tentative place to be because you can at best can only describe where you are or what you've actually experienced but to project your view of history and your view of the aspirations of peoples um, onto peoples who lived 200 years ago um, can be very dangerous can be very tentative and so as part of what we and a teleology um, you might say is uh, um, the type of stories that um, that's, that really talk about how something it, it was destined to be and for that matter that it might have even been God's uh, destiny um, that certain events emerge, that certain artistic trends emerge. And so when we're looking at this sense of teleology of art, even what we would call art movements, and whether it be um, Baroque, uh, whether it be Rococo, whether it be uh, pre-impressionism, impressionism, impressionism, post-impressionism, Fauvism, futurism, Dada, surrealism, uh, all of these isms that we talk about as the way that Europeans and Euro-Americans have made sense of art history, um, that that th there is a danger in using this construction of art history to describe the histories of other peoples around the world who were not aware that they were abstract expressionist artists 150 years ago. This is not going to be your average contemporary Native American art history class. It's a course in thinking and the same concepts that we apply as we are describing, as we are analyzing the um, artistic impulses of the indigenous peoples of, uh, of the United States and to some degree Canada, that we are doing so in a way that we think critically about the way that native art has been perceived whether it be in the prehistoric to the historic uh, to the colonial and to the post-colonial or post-modern and to what we would call contemporary which is modern day we are living in a contemporary era and this is the irony because we are always contemporary you are always as long as you are alive a contemporary person and that's what makes contemporary art history seem like a conundrum because isn't history something that we study about in the past that is if we buy into the older models and the dominant fiction because history is something that is actually at least three-dimensional in other words we think about history of yes the events that occurred we also think about history of events that can occur in the future but we also can view it from a contemporary sense because the the forces that we set in motion through our conscious actions today shape the history of tomorrow so history is a creative act and you are partaking in it in order to do so in 
an effective and a reasoned and in a thought-provoking and in a thoughtful manner. It's very important to be aware of how when we're talking about Native American art the that Native peoples have been perceived and there is this notion of you might have heard the saying that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder and we have to understand that the way that the arts of Native peoples are talked about today is not the same way that arts were talked about a hundred years ago or a hundred fifty years ago because the creative impulses of native peoples were seen more as artifact they were seen more as craft it is only in the late twentieth century that uh, works that were created formerly in a tribal sense and in the so-called craft sense that were elevated to art such as auctions of native american art that have been done by butterfields or Sotheby's major auction houses in the united states and in great britain um, where there was a need uh, by people who collected art to find fresh uh, places to from which to draw um, their artistic collections and so once the you might say the tap was dry the well was dry on contemporary art um, as well as historic art of Europeans and other then attention was turned to tribal peoples in order to do so um, this had to be uh, there had to be a connection that occurred and that would be how did primitive art as it was called then influence modern art and then ultimately contemporary and postmodern art and we'll talk about this uh, later on in the semester too because this is going to be an underlying theme um, this overlap this so-called cross-pollination between primitive artists and the artists of say the early 20th century including Picasso including Marsden Hartley including Jackson Pollock including Barnett Newman uh, that's, that we have to understand that this is part of the outside looking in. This is part of a dominant fiction. This is part of the attempt to, in essence, absorb the artistic impulses of native peoples into the dominant story in order to make their art valid to people who already understand, who are already participating in this dominant art story. So in the early 20th century, um, artists, writers, and other anthrop and art anthropologists really had romantic and even outright racist conceptions of native peoples. Um, that most people, with the most um, most of what people knew about American Indians or about uh, First Nations, Canadian Indians, or Indians in general, um, was second and third hand. And whether it be through um, film, whether it be through literature, uh, whether it be through theater, um, whether it be through music, they were getting um, these romantic and what it means romantic. And in other words, we are. Um, we are projecting our own ideas of the ideal from our own cultural um, uh, viewpoint onto other people and showing how noble they are. So we're seeing only the good in them and we are romanticizing them. We have fallen in love with them. We have fallen in love with the noble savage. We have fallen in love with Uncas, uh, the last of the Mohicans. You know, we have fallen in love with these people. But they are, in many ways, they are cardboard figures. They are, um, they are caricatures. And then there are the outright racist conceptions of native peoples that persisted too, particularly as a result of spiritual and indeed even artistic practices. Regardless, there it tended to be a preservationist approach to their art. In other words, it was believed that these peoples at the early 20th century it was called vanishing Indians, vanishing Americans. They were going to vanish, and so you had to preserve what was left of their art, of their creative impulses, um, for future generations to understand before these people vanished. And so this, these, these notions of, uh, of. Uh, of romanticism, of racism, as well as you might say what we could what we'll call, and we'll mention this term later on in the semester, museumification. All right, putting something under glass in a museum to be studied out of its original context. Um, these were all parts of the way that American Indians and their creative impulses were perceived by the dominant society, particularly through artists, through writers, and through social scientists. The renowned artist Barnett Newman, who was infatuated with art of American Indians, in particular, uh, and we'll look at some of his work later on in the semester as, it, as exemplifying this notion of romanticism, um, he was very wrapped up in Northwest Coast art, but he was also very wrapped up in sculpture of Mesoamerica. And 
this uh, and several of the events we'll talk about will be significant um, art exhibits that occurred in the 20th century that in many ways were laying the foundations to start to appreciate American Indian art as fine art whether it be an armory exhibit in New York City whether it be the Golden Gate exhibit whether it be the various expositions whether it be um, the Museum of Modern Art exhibition um, that these were and then with this the uh, art of pre-Columbian America um, sculpture in particular uh, the catalog that Barnett uh, Newman uh, wrote to accompany this exhibition this is a statement that Newman made in 1944 uh, that it's becoming more and more apparent that to understand modern art one must have an appreciation of the primitive arts for just as modern art stands as an island of revolt in the stream of Western European aesthetics the many primitive art traditions stand apart as authentic accomplishments that flourished without the benefit of European history however just the very fact that he names them primitive arts ju the very fact that he says that they are an island in the revolt of the stream of Western European aesthetics shows that he is including them within this overall rubric this overall perception so even though he is saying they stand apart from he's saying that as an artist you have to understand this interrelationship um, of primitive arts but he's named it primitive arts which means that he is projecting the other because the arts as the as were perceived by the people who created them whether they be the Haida whether they be the Maya were not delineated as primitive arts as they created them so these are terminologies that are applied from a, what we could call a 2020 hindsight and they are applied by people who were not part of that artistic tradition and so while it appears to be complementary and, and Newman is making this call you know for people to learn more about so-called primitive arts believe it or not in the same breath he is already defining them as separate apart from and in some ways even the way that people perceive that word primitive um, maybe even inferior now when I talk about primitive I, what I'm talking about is early all right primal something very early in the development um, but that tends not to be the way that many art historians um, use that word because primitive arts are often very connected to uh, tribal arts so we have to understand that even as part of this dialogue whether it be the writers the anthropologists and even as part of the romanticization that the romanticization can be just as damaging as the racialization um, that other peoples could be doing A key understanding to gain from this McMaster article is to be able to really describe what a frontier space is. A frontier space is a space that was called frontier by a colonizing nation but was already occupied by the people who became colonized so when you hear about for example the the uh, the settling of the West the settling of America the settling of Mexico the settling of New Mexico more appropriately it would be called the destruction of the original peoples and the resettling by colonizers if we were to really challenge this dominant fiction so a colonized frontier space is a space that was formerly inhabited by other people and then was colonized and then these people if they were lucky survived the colonizing process so this is an important understanding to have when we're talking about contemporary Native American art because a lot and, and for this class because we aren't going to talk much about really beautiful bracelets and really wonderful pottery in the so-called contemporary traditional arts we will talk about them to some degree but what we are talking more about in this class is the art of identity and the art of how peoples have survived this whole process and how they have um, whether their view of the world has remained completely intact or how it's been changed as a result of this interaction of art histories by people with separate and distinct cultures and the notion that even what we would call American Indians or Native Americans is a falsehood there are no Native Americans there are no American Indians that is a dominant fiction constructed by colonizers in order to make blanket policy about 
people who are culturally dissimilar and in order to do so you have to invent an identity for them because 150 years ago um, people who were Lakota did not see themselves as being um, blood brothers with people who were Onondaga Right, that and the people who were Pueblo did not see themselves uh, as being blood brothers with the Diné or the Apache. All right, these are these are uh, constructions, and so the and these occurred in a colonized frontier space. So to understand the artistic uh, impulses that are coming out of this and the images that are going to be part of this commentary of what we're going to look at in this class, we have to understand what artists are commenting about. And this, uh, and I think in a very real way, is laid out effectively, although at times very opaquely, by uh, Gerald McMaster, because sometimes the language can be a little bit dense. And that's why I tell you, you've got to get a dictionary for this class. So Thomas McEverly, uh when he's talking about colonized nations, and they're presenting a universal ideology where local knowledge is disregarded. In other words, what the colonizing nations have done is that they have taken their own view of the world and they have, they have placed it in a new context and said that it still applies there. All right, so they deny local knowledge, they deny the local uh, knowledge of the indigenous peoples, and instead replace it with um, standards that are um, their own. And this, whether it, it could be things such as water use, for example, it could be the notion that you could control nature. Um, for example, um, there's a reason you don't find a lot of villages, uh, American Indian villages, um, near New Orleans. All right, and and that reason being, it floods along the Mississippi River, and so you're not going to build um, temporary, you're not going to build um, full-time cities there. Only fools would build a city underwater with dikes and believe you're going to control the ocean. That is taking a universal ideology that you can conquer nature, where local knowledge says you don't want to build in a swamp, you don't want to build there. All right, but this notion that science can um, beat everything um, was put in this local area, and when Katrina hit, New Orleans went underwater. Um, that the, this is a this is an example of how uh, a people's view, uh, uh, an ideology, all right, an ideology is a, a, we, we could say a, a cluster of ideas that gives uh, shape and gives reason, gives cause. Um, of of the events that we see around us, part of this ideology is evolution. The sense, uh, and we could say it even cultural evolution, that that the people who are colonized are believed to be in part of an evolutionary model. In other words, part of what was developed as part of the colonizing process was that human societies move through certain stages in their development. So they go from um, savagery, living in caves, you know, po possibly even cannibalism, um, to uh, barbarism. Which is a step up from uh, um, savagery through um, through becoming hunter gatherers um, to becoming uh, settled people to be then to living in cities then to living in city states then to living in nations and then all of this is accompanied by certain religious um, evolutionary trends as well as architectural uh, governmental uh, philosophical and things necessarily have to move along this way. And so it would completely boggle people's minds that in Central America that there would be these vast cities of stone um, that the Maya and the uh, Toltec constructed and then they abandoned. Rather, and 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 people would wonder what happened to them. You know, they you know that you've got to go bigger and better. You've and and they just leave. Why would this happen? It doesn't fit the evolutionary model that's laid out by the Western view of progress, which is an ideology. So part of this ideology is this notion of progress, too. So the colonizers assume that the people they are colonizing are inferior, that they should be ruled by the colonizers. There is a very famous poem called The, the White Man's Burden. I strongly suggest you read it. It was written by Rudyard Kipling, the same one who wrote The Jungle Book. And it talks about um, this notion that white people have to bring dark people into the 19th century and bring them in so that they have the benefits of white man's civilization. Don't take my word for it. Read the poem. But this, uh, this notion also assumes that colonizers assume that the colonized strive toward the similar goals as the colonizers then, which is not true. 
what has occurred is that colonialism is actually dragged then people a historic in essence means that it, it's that it seems as if they didn't have a history all right or they didn't have a history that fit within the european um, a view of history. So whether it be the Chinese at the time of uh, British colonial empire or Africa or India or American Indian. Um, so what, what colonialism does is it absorbs them. It's almost like the Borg. It absorbs them into the dominant colonial view of history as part of this natural progress of Europe of Europe, and then the way that Europe has civilized the world. There was a, a saying at one time that the sun never sets on the British Empire. Empire building is part of this ideology that things have to get larger um, and this is part of this frontier space then and it is in the survival in the wake of colonialism that Native American artists are, are making this commentary so you really have to understand that it's not just art it's a commentary about identity it's a commentary about a, a set of processes that were unleashed on peoples and uh, they were processes that people survived and are now um, through their creative works are starting to not only comment about what was but how things are so if we contrast the colonized frontier space with heterotropic space we're looking at uh, in essence in this new way of viewing art history a space that is inhabited by many different peoples with many different histories it is an acknowledgement of the coexistence of fragmentary possibilities in other words that our knowledge of history itself is fragmented and we have a hard enough time making sense of our own history from our own cultural perspective much less making sense of histories that we see as the other and this has been a challenge because historians have now went when it was thought that Native Americans were going to vanish for example and they survived and now they're 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 left with the challenge of having to create a history for people who were seemed to be assumed to be a historical to seem to have no history or as if history was going to stop or was absorbed into um, other nations it is, it's an acknowledgement then that there are art histories and that these art histories aren't the creation of contemporary historians that they have always existed that there was a history here long before the arrival of Europeans and not just one history but many different histories of many different cultures and once again Native American is an invented term it's a political term to homogenize people who are culturally dissimilar and historically dissimilar so we have to acknowledge that there are art histories that we call it and we talk about it in a plural sense then and if there are plural art histories then there are plural cultural histories so these creative traditions that we talk about were separate and distinct from the dominant views that emerge and these uh, these creative traditions they emerged on their own sense of historical timeline that they converged with the histories of other people and then they diverged in other words they separated from other world traditions too so that we don't talk about history in the singular sense we talk about it in the plural sense and with this understanding that we have trouble making sense of our own history and it's a real challenge to make sense of the history of other people around the world and so when we're looking at Native American art histories we have to do this as a as a starting point our understanding that our um, our history and our description of history itself is going to be incomplete and we are doing our best to make sense of it with the information that we have available and in doing so we may have to shed um, some previously um, accepted ideologies terminologies um, and language that was used to describe the colonized people so that we see this uh, heterotropic space as a sense of being global as well as pluralistic rather than universalistic like universalistic means there's one story that applies to everyone um, as compared to pluralistic is that there are many stories that apply to the people they are describing that means that we are going to some degree be uh, replacing language and to what degree does the language of art history actually apply to formerly a historical people in other words can you really say that um, that uh, an American Indian painter such as Dan Naminga is an abstract painter 
Can we really say that Stan Natchez uh, works with found objects? Can we really say um, that that is how these artists would describe themselves as they understand their own artistic traditions from their own cultural backgrounds? The challenge being that we're communicating often in a language um, that is foreign to the people at times who are creating the art. In other words, if Mohawk is your first language, or if Spanish is your first language, when you're talking about a, a art history um, in an English-speaking class, there are going to be incomplete understandings based on the way that language itself operates. So with, with this common, what we'll call currency of using the English language, um, how can we use this language to describe and how have artists themselves described their own identity um, in English or for that matter in invented terms um, or in the reshaping of terms um, or the redefinition of terms without being apologetic. In other words, how do they use language to describe themselves without saying I'm sorry um, for changing this definition or I'm sorry for describing um, the way that I see the world and I'm so sorry for inventing new words for that matter. So that's why uh, when you hear things like post-Indian um, or survivance, um, whether it be um, from uh, Joe Peters or whether it be from Gerald Visner, um, that these are uh, the new types of language that have emerged. When we talk about indigena, as is used by um, Gerald McMaster, when we look at an exhibit that was mounted by McMaster and colleagues called indigena, when we, when we look at terminology such as Reservation X as part of this replacing a language that formerly was used to dominate and we are replacing it with language that is used to claim power from the inside looking out. So we have to ask ourselves, how do Native American and non-Native critics and artists comment about creative histories of Native Americans? That's why you're going to be reading um, texts and articles that are written by Native artists, authors as well as uh, Native artists as well as non-Native authors and artists. And then you'll see that um, the, you'll see that there are distinct differences in the way that someone's um, identity shapes the way they write about art and they write about art histories. And for that matter, how do Native American and non-Native critics and artists cre critique the creative works too? Um, and does the language of criticism on European art really apply? How does the language of postmodern art really apply to American Indian art? These are all challenges that we face when we're talking about contemporary art, particularly when we're doing so with the focus on um, Native American art and by extension the art of First Nations in Canada. So as the semester unfolds, um, ask yourselves some of these types of questions, but also ask yourselves um, what are the historical and cultural forces that cause these various artists that we're going to be looking at to construct their world and then construct physical manifestations of their thoughts, uh, their art, um, as the way they view the world. What are the forces throughout history and as well as in a contemporary sense that cause artists and for that matter critics um, to, to work in this manner. And we'll find out that uh, we start to get a greater understanding not only of the art histories of many different peoples but of global history.